Welcome to week four, uh, a very interesting week in the NFL because it might have the best game of the year and the worst game of the year all within the same two day period. Um, I'm not sure whether to be excited or horrified by the slate that we're talking about today. It's mostly good games, but not going to lie, I lied in the title a little bit. We, we have to talk about Bears Broncos. It's not one of the five best games, but it might end up being uh, the game that America is glued to the most uh, because it, it could very well decide where Caleb Williams calls home next year. Uh, before we get into all that, though, EJ, how you doing? I'm dead inside. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, there's not a lot to like about Bears football, and that's fine. But this is a really good slate. Um, and yes, we have some tremendous games, and then we've got whatever that's going to be. And that's that's going to be a thing for folks who, you know, like viewing footage of old train wrecks as a hobby. Like, <laughs> that's that's going to be the game for them. Uh, and it's it's not only got huge ramifications for uh, the Bears regime, however short lived it may be. I mean, let's be honest. Tangent. They're probably all going to get fired, right? Probably. Like they, the Bears historically don't fire anybody in season. So everybody calling for Ibufus's head or whatever, like they don't they don't fire people in season. They just don't do it. They don't believe in it. Like. And honestly, it's probably not going to help a lot. Like, you think elevating a position coach is going to make this, like, a lot better right now? Probably not. So they're going to be in place for the whole season, which is both horrific uh, as a Bears fan (laughs) because you're not going to see a whole lot of change. uh, And we'll talk about it when we get to that game that there are some historic things going on. Like, as if you live through the end of the Tressman era, it was really, really bad. Back-to-back 50 burgers is what everybody brings up. Um, statistically, the last 13 games, the last losses for the Bears have been worse. They have lost by an average. Now, this is hard to do. An average of three touchdowns, like 21.5 points per game over the last 13 games is the margin of defeat. Like we always talk about how hard it is to be good in the NFL. And it is because it's the top league in the world. Everybody's competing as hard as they can. The best athletes are there. It's very difficult to win in the NFL. It is also difficult to lose that badly, that consistently. So if you thought the end of the Trestman era was horrible, it was. And in some ways, this is worse, and we're going to see lots more of it, like lots and lots more of it, which is not a thing to get excited about if you're a Bears fan. So yeah, they're probably all going to get fired at the end of the year. The question mark is Ryan Poles, whether or not Kevin Warren, the newly appointed president, wants a completely clean slate, or whether he gives Poles a shot to get his coach, Eberflutes wasn't really his coach, his coach and his quarterback, and gives him you know, a little bit of runway to deal with that, whether he thinks that's fair or whether he says enough's enough, can't handle it. Like your work to this point has been, you know, exemplary clearing the salary cap and not so great everywhere else. You know, that's the, that's the real question is, you know, I think the coaching staff is pretty much as good as gone. If they're not, I don't know how you justify that. Like, I'm not sure how you go, we're going to run this back at the end of this particular dumpster fire. Um, The question is whether or not Poles gets to stay around. Well, we'll get to that game a little bit later and and expand on our thoughts. I need to get uh, a little bit more of this rum in me before we we dive into that one. Uh, We have a much more entertaining game, I should say. Maybe not more important, but in the context of the future of the league, but in terms of entertainment and deciding the the right now of the league, you know, deciding who's going to be the top dog in 2023, perhaps there's no more important game than Dolphins Bills. Have to imagine this one's going to uh, be a, a pretty influential game when it comes to playoff seeding, potentially for the first seed. You know, uh, Miami's at the top of the mountain right now, but Buffalo after having a pretty terrible week one, has rebounded to look like the Bills that we know and love. We fully expect both these teams to be there in January, uh, and we fully expect that perhaps one of them is going to be the team that's hosting every single playoff game in the lead-up to the Super Bowl. So, uh, EJ, while I pour myself a nice stiff drink, feel free to get us started on Dolphins-Bills. 
<laughs> Two teams that had really high expectations coming in. These are these are not surprise teams. They've also started hot, and they are playing some of the best football in the NFL on both sides of the ball, and that's rare. Usually there's one particular matchup between – an offensive unit, the defensive unit in a game that we like to focus on that we think is going to be the real crux. Not so in this one. Both sides of the ball for both of these teams are playing at a very high level. It's got everything. So get your snacks early. Make sure to go to the bathroom at halftime. You're not going to want to miss a lot of snaps in this one. There are stars throughout both lineups, and they are playing up to expectations, and that's something. We talk about a lot of teams that have not lived up to expectations or have exceeded them. Both of these teams had them and are meeting them. Places I'll be paying extra attention to. Bill's pass pro. Dolphins pass rush has been super hot at some times, a little bit cooler at others. Um, which one shows up and can the Bills hold the fins in check if they are in full throat? If Jalen Phillips and Wilkins and everybody else are absolutely tearing, can they hold up or does Josh have to run for his life? Bill's run game, they've been a lot better about run pass balance this year than they have in previous years, and that is a good thing uh, for the Bills. But can they make hay against a very good and very fast Dolphins defense when they really need to, or are they going to be forced into being, quote-unquote, left-handed? Um, I would imagine that's the aim of the Fangio defense is to say, nope, we're going to make you one-dimensional, and really what we want to do is make Josh play hero ball, and if he beats us, he beats us. Um, that is possible, but we kind of like our odds if we get you into that place. Um, so they'll be trying to do it, and I would imagine they would leverage that by saying, yeah, you don't get to run today. You have, you have to throw, and we're going to try and make even those windows harder than normal. Tyreek Hill versus the Bills secondary, which played the lights out last week. Something has to give. Both of those, again, both sides are playing extremely well. Tyreek's playing at eye level. Bill's secondary is elite. I will take no arguments at this time. When everybody's on the field, they are really, really good. And something's going to win there. Uh, this is a rock and a hard place. Something's got to come out on top. We'll see which. And the last one is McDaniel's brain versus Matt Milano containing the middle of the field. Like, McDaniel really likes to move people, especially linebackers, to make voids in the middle of the field. And he is going to try his damnedest to move Matt Milano. And Matt Milano doesn't want to move and is smart enough not to in a lot of cases. And freelances when he needs to and still makes plays. So that is a tremendous matchup of an incredibly smart and capable and highly underrated defender, in my opinion, in the NFL, versus a coach who is completely in his bag right now and pretty much having his way with making defenses do what he wants through formation, through motion, um, through routes and combinations. That's going to be a chess match all day long. I think they're both going to win a few. I want to see who wins more. To put this game into context, and, and I'll give some overall numbers before I give some scheme stats here. So the Dolphins are first in points per game. They're first in yards per play. They're first in red zone scoring percentage. They're 32nd in third downs per game at nine, uh, which sounds bad, but it's actually good because they never actually get to third down. They score so quickly. <laughs> Uh, Houston is first at 17 third downs per game, so uh, Miami is basically half of that. That's how efficient they are on early downs. Uh, they're first in passing yards per game and first in rushing yards per game. Like, it's it's absurd. Uh, the Bills, meanwhile, defensively, are second in points allowed per game. They are second in yards allowed per game. They are second in red zone scoring percentage allowed. They are third in pass yards allowed per game, and they are first in takeaways per game at three. That's three per game, by the way. So they have nine already, and we're not even a month into the year. I get it. Bill's offense, very good when they're on their A game. We love watching Josh Allen do his thing, but the story of this game is Bill's defense versus Dolphins offense it's it's good on good it's elite on elite um it it's honestly the thing I'm most looking forward to watching this weekend in terms of uh more in-depth scheme stats if we're looking at the typical cadence for this Bills defense you know what what can Mike McDaniel expect to see they're extremely zone heavy on first downs, in particular, uh, love running quarters against two by two looks, which Miami is in two by two a lot, not necessarily as much in trips. And if they get into trips, it's because they're motioning into it at the snap. Um, but when they do see trips, they'll roll down from quarters uh, and play cover three against it. So that's what you can expect to see from the Bills on first down. On second down, they are really, really heavy into man coverage or 
calling fire zones if it's second and short or second and medium. Uh, they want to try to get somebody into the backfield on these fire zone calls, try to generate some negative plays, get them into third and long. Um, but if it's if it's like second and a long medium or uh, second and and long period, you can expect to see a ton of man coverage. And then uh, on third down, if they can get them into a third medium or third and long with those aggressive second down calls, that's when they're going to back off. Um, and depending on receiver distribution, it'll either be a lot of cover two or it'll be a lot of quarter, quarter, half or half, quarter, quarter. So again, very zone heavy on third down. Not a very aggressive defense in terms of blitzes, like bringing extra bodies outside of those second down calls, but definitely aggressive in terms of uh, the angles of approach they take when rushing the passer. There's stunts all over the place. There's twists all over the place. Like they'll bring four most of the time, but they're going to bring four in funky ways. So <laughs> it's a it's a really really interesting defense overall. I would say second down is the key down because again a lot of man coverage on second down there. Um, I'm curious how all that man coverage handles these motions from Miami. How do they sort it out? Do they even bother playing man because they don't want to get got by all these motions? Um, it's I'm not entirely sure yet. But we're going to see, and I think how they handle how they handle man against Miami, whether it works or doesn't work, is going to be very informative for the rest of the league. Because if Buffalo can't do anything about all these motions, I don't know if anybody can do anything about all these motions. The motion thing is fascinating. We hit on it after week one as a, hey, this is new and this is a wrinkle. It's continued through the next few weeks. And the thing that makes it so difficult is when the Dolphins snap the ball. They put the mm -hmm. guy in short motion, and they literally snap it as he is crossing behind the other receiver, like in that split second, right when the shift on defense would be occurring. And pretty much every team up to this point in the rest of the league has given the defense at least a half a second to go, all right, you got him, you got him, cool. The Dolphins do it at that moment to put as much possible stress on the defense as possible. So right as you would be handing off your responsibility in the defense, they snap it right then. And you have to decide with very fast guys on offense, who's got who right now. And if you're a step slow, that's all they need. There's so many routes in that offense that if you are not on it on the first step, if you are not in your leverage, if you are not in your technique, and all it takes is that quick hesitation and it is because of when they snap in that motion they give you zero time to decide it's like i got it i got it i got it oh hang on oh damn and they do it over and over and over again and it's fascinating it'll be really cool to see how the league adapts and adjusts to that because let's be honest the league adapts to everything that happens on either side of the ball it all evens out after a while but for right now the dolphins are flogging people with that move there's basically only three defenses in the league that i think even have a shot right now against this team <laughs> and it's it's buffalo kansas city because kansas city's defense is nasty really we haven't talked enough about it like they're really really good uh, and then cleveland who we're going to talk about in the next game like their defense is unbelievable honestly and and again buffalo is like the first it's like the mini boss here before they work their way up to kc and cleveland which i know sounds like an insult to bills fans but like seriously watch cleveland's defense oh my god um yeah. But it, it, how Buffalo handles this is going to be so informative for these other teams that we expect to be there in January. Because at this point, the Browns, even without Nick Chubb, might be there in January. Their defense is that good. They could still win the division just with that. Uh, so it's, it's a really, really fascinating matchup. In terms of how I built my underdog slip, because, uh, again, I take, I take somebody from every one of these games that we talk about, and I throw them into a slip, and I build basically a slip out of this show. Uh, except for Bears Broncos. I'm not doing anything for that game. But for this game, I was hunting and I was I was like, okay, how do I throw anybody in from the Dolphins here? I'm not entirely sure because I don't know how the Bills are going to play them. Do I throw in Josh Allen here? I'm not entirely sure because the Dolphins defense it's, itself is pretty good against the pass. And I was kind of working my way through all these options. And I was like, all right, if I'm going to if I'm going to take any offensive player from this game, which we expect to be high flying to say the least. I went with James Cook because if mm. there is 
any defensive weakness for either of these teams on the field. I do think the Dolphins' run defense is a little soft. Um, if you're going to get them in any way at all, I think it is on the ground. So I took James Cook higher than 54 and a half rushing. Do I think he's going to have a ridiculously dominant day? No. Do I think that he's going to do, again, like you said, enough to provide balance? Absolutely. And I think providing balance is more than 55 yards. My only worry in that is that they may, they being the Bills, may have to pivot to the screen replacing the run game, right? They may have to go to short tosses, and those are going to count as receptions, not rushing yards. So he is going to come up with production, more combined production than that for sure. But within that overall total, where's the rush receiving balance going to be? And that worries me because trying to slam into like, Christian Wilkins is a tough day. So they may say, hey, we're just going to motion you out, throw you a quick screen. You know, we may have line action blocking the other way, try and sneak you out of the backfield to, again, limit some of the defenders you're going to see. Those are going to count as receptions. But, yeah, I think the line indicates that it's going to be a tough rushing day. Like 50-ish rushing yards is not a big line for a team that has been effective rushing the ball so far. So it's an acknowledgement that, Hey, this, this is going to be tough sledding. Um, you know, we're not setting this line at 70 yards. We're setting it at yeah. whatever it is. 54. Either way, this game's going to be a war. I can't wait. Really quick interjection here. And then I promise we'll get right back to the show. We are sponsored this week by a brand that is near and dear to my heart. Quite literally Viore. If you're watching the YouTube version of this show, I'm wearing them right now. This is one of their crew necks that I like in Burgundy. I picked it up at one of their physical store locations near me because they're based in Southern California, but obviously they do most of their business online. Their entire brand is all about creating clothes that you can be active in or go out in. Their activewear lines for both men and women are insanely extensive. They have basically everything you can think of for people who like to either hit the gym or go for a run or just do any physical activity whatsoever. But they also have a ton of different styles meant for the office or just lounging around on a Sunday watching football. For me personally, I'm a bigger dude, obviously, and so it's hard for me to shop with certain brands, but Viore's not one of them. They make clothes for people of all sizes and body types, even mine, and I mean, shit, if I can look good at them, anybody can. It's all very high quality materials as well, so they're going to last you a long time. I'm a big believer in investing in quality clothing that lasts longer, so I don't have to buy clothes that often, and I can cut down on my personal clothing waste over my lifetime, because we all know that clothing waste is really, really horrible for the environment. So if you're looking for clothes that'll hold up to the demands of your daily life, and they look good, and you can be active in them, check out Viore. If you go through their catalog at viori.com slash filmroom, that is V-U-O-R-I dot com slash filmroom at the link in the description below. And if you find something you like, you can get 20% off your first purchase. So that's a pretty good discount there. Thank you again to Viori for sponsoring the show and for the 20% discount for our audience. And with that, let's get back to it. Uh, speaking of war between division rivals, Ravens-Browns second game of the week that we're talking about. Um, I have a whole bunch of fun Browns defense stats. I know you have a bunch of thoughts on the Browns defense. They're kind of the star of the show uh, right now for me. And we haven't talked about them enough in the first three weeks. And so I want to make up for that in this <laughs> segment and just wax poetic about Jim Schwartz because he has done a phenomenal job so far. The entire reason I picked this game, look, AFC North games are always a war. We say that all the time. The entire reason I picked this particular game when we were div divvying up games last night is we have to talk about the Browns defense. Just like we have to talk about the KC defense, Easy Cheese fans, we will. They are very, very good. The Browns are better. And that's saying something. So lowest completion percentage against, 48.3. Lowest passing yards uh, per attempt, at 3.8 lowest passing yards total at 335 now remember this is three games they've given a one pass td in that time um you know rushing we're talking about again it, it's not a one-sided defense which is the thing i love the most like the eagles have the best rushing defense in the nfl no surprise with all their investment on the d-line and some good play from linebackers this year too Browns are second. So Eagles have allowed 145, Browns 156. They're crushing against the run. 
yards per carry, they're actually better than the Eagles. They are second in the league behind only the Titans. Mike Vrabel, again, knows how to put together a run defense and has a very good defensive line. The Browns, 2.8. The Titans, only at 2.6. And they have allowed no rushing touchdowns. So the job that's being done end-to-end on the Cleveland defense right now Jim Schwartz could run for any political office he wanted to in (laughs) Cleveland right now, probably all of Ohio, and win in a landslide. He has transformed talent, which they've always had. We've talked about the Browns' defense for the last three years and waxed poetic about the amount of talent, how good their drafts were, how deep they were on all those units. They didn't have the results. He's taken all that talent and turned it into results, and he deserves all the credit for that. One of the wildest stat to me, uh, when it comes to the Cleveland defense, they still haven't allowed a red zone touchdown uh, <laughs> the entire year. And they've only allowed two red zone possessions the entire year. Like they yep. average, well, I use the term allowed loosely. There was a fumble that led to one of them. So <laughs> they didn't even really allow that one. Um, but you want to know what was wild of- about that? <laughs> what? The second play after that happened wasn't red zone because they pushed it back. No, they pushed three times in a row. They got three negative plays in a row. <laughs> so it's like, no, 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 no. You don't get to be within 20 yards of our end zone. So if we're talking about like actual natural red zone possessions allowed, we're talking about one in three games. The average is three per game. So the fact that not only do they have a great red zone defense, but they have a great red zone defense because you can't even get to the red zone <laughs> is absolutely unreal. Um their secondary is playing out of its mind. Grant Delp, it's been phenomenal. All their corners have been phenomenal. And we talked about that going into the year of like, this secondary is just loaded, like absolutely loaded beyond belief. It's the best secondary in football. Again, I know Bills fans will get upset by that, but like, look at the results. You can't play man coverage 42% of the time on first down without having dudes in your secondary. And they got dudes. Like, the fact that they can line up and play man that much on first down, they can play it a third of the time on second down, they can play it 36% of the time on third down, you know what they're going to do. Like, they don't they don't really do anything crazy or exotic on defense. They're just like, yeah, we're better than you. Go ahead and beat us. And you can't. They're too good. And, you know, part of the reason why uh, Miles Garrett, other than just being Miles Garrett, but part of the reason why he's been, uh, you know, stacking up pressures and sacks like crazy so far is because quarterbacks have to hold the ball. There's just no space. You know, they're, they're not playing that much zone coverage. And so guys can't just settle uh, into holes between zones and give quarterbacks quick throws. Like it's all man coverage. It's all like tight, tight match zone. You know, there's just no space. And so quarterbacks kind of have to like think a little bit and they're, they're pumping <laughs> and they're not entirely sure if they have space to throw. And then, oh God, here comes Miles Garrett. So it, everything's just working in concert right now. Their run defense is vastly improved, uh, partly because of, you know, personnel changes they made to their interior uh, defensive line. But it's just an unreal defense overall. And the fact that they're this good without really doing anything exotic scheme wise they're just better than everybody that means it's sustainable so god help the ravens this week they have a very good defense themselves like again they had 84 Mm -hmm. plays against the colts last week and only allowed 22 points and and part of that was just because of fumbles um so the ravens defense is very good in its own right i don't expect either of these teams to score that much um but if i had to bet on which team is more likely to win on the back of their defense this week. I'd have to go with Cleveland because they're they're just the best in the league so far. They've only allowed 15 first downs in three games, mm-hmm. like total. <laughs> that There are teams that allow 15 first downs in a game, and they are completely suffocating. And you said on the Ravens' side, Ravens' defense is really good. They've only given up three TDs. They're going to push Cleveland to the limit. That's likely if you're on the Ravens offense and you're looking at how they need to attack this if you're Todd Mocken and you're saying hey how do we how do we try and get any leverage against this very good defense they've got to diversify a little bit right now there's a lot on Lamar's shoulders too much really on Lamar's shoulders and it hasn't 
come that way through design. That's not Monken's fault. They have tried to get other folks involved. Um, guys like Isaiah Likely, who played a big role last year, they're throwing the ball to him. It was really wet last year. He didn't make, or last week, last week, he didn't make a lot of those catches. Andrews is typically a guy they lean on uh, really to power this. He's been effectively wide receiver one in Baltimore for a long time. Now he doesn't have to be because Zay's there. And Zay is working, but all the guys around him have to come to play. Gus is going to continue to try and get yards, which would be very difficult against that front. But when they do get a route that hits Isaiah Likely in the hands, he has to catch it. Same with Andrews. I want to see Rashad Bateman get, I don't know, three or four targets instead of one or two per game. He needs some help. Lamar is amazing, and we know that. But if you put it all on Lamar's shoulders, and I'm sure Schwartz wants to do that, you'll probably beat this team because he might, <laughs> he will, I should say, score a touchdown. You don't think he should, but it'll be one or two, and you can live with that if you're playing a guy like Lamar and he only gets six points against you. That's that's a recipe for success. So Monken's got to try and diversify. It's it's a rough slate. If I was uh, if I had fantasy players and they were on the Ravens this week, I don't think I'd be picking them because they're going up against Cleveland's defense. But um, Ravens defense, like you said, has played really tough. And look, the Browns offense has not been amazing. They've been enough, but they have not been amazing. They certainly have not received a lot of great play at the quarterback position. I, we both like Jerome Ford, and he's come right in and sort of kept on churning, which is really good news for them. Um, they're going to have to try and turn it up. And again, the Ravens defense is going to come at you. They're going to bring a lot of pressure. Uh, they're not going to make it easy. So this is going to be a knockdown drag out. I really like the strength of Cleveland's defense. Um, the Ravens are going to have to do something that they haven't done in the first three weeks and diversify that offense if they've got a chance in this one. I will say, uh, even though I've talked up the the Browns defense so much. I did take a Ravens offensive player for this underdog oh. slip, but I did it for a very strategic reason, EJ. Okay. Okay. Convince because me. Of, <laughs> because of all the man coverage that the Browns play, and and we're pretty sure that they're going to cover up these receivers as much as we love the Ravens receivers, uh, or at least some of the Ravens receivers. I was going to say, all of them? <laughs> the, the ones that are left, you know? Like, we love Zay, we love Andrews. Like, but the, the Browns are going to challenge those guys, right? I don't know if there's really going to be anywhere to throw. But in man coverage, where is a DB's back to turn to? The quarterback. So I took Lamar higher than 46 and a half rushing because oh, it's like very that. possible that the only answer that Baltimore has for all this man coverage is Lamar running, right? And... Cleveland does have speed on the second level that may or may not be able to corral him, but I would rather bet on Lamar uh, being able to uh, to beat guys in space than not, you know, because historically that's that's proven to be a pretty good bet. So given all the man we're going to see, given all the, the four-man rushes that we're going to see, which means that there should be, because uh, again, when they play man coverage, they don't, they don't usually bring five. It's more like uh, we're playing one rat. So we got one guy who's sitting as a rat defender who's probably going to be watching Lamar. With four man rushes, there are going to be more lanes to escape. All the DBs with their back turned. I just think, from a schematic perspective, this is set up for a Lamar save us with your your legs type of game. So uh, higher than forty six and a half rushing for me. Am I crazy? No, I actually like that one for a couple of reasons. You mentioned a couple. The others I like is Monken has shown that he's not afraid to put in designed runs. It's not just scrambles, which Lamar is excellent at, and they are very difficult to account for because you might have a defender spying Lamar. I don't really care. Can he catch him? Like, just because mm -hmm. he knows that he's going to run doesn't mean he's going to be able to stop him like you are with some quarterbacks. So that's one facet of the run game is the unplanned pieces. But Monken's also shown two or three times a game that he is going to design rushes for Lamar's legs. So... And like you said, they might be reduced to that. The Ravens might be reduced to, hey, nothing else is working. Lamar's Lamar. We're just going to ride him in this one and see how far he can take us. And if that's the case, I like him going over that number rushing wise. So, no, you're not crazy. Let's get to our next game on the docket here. Uh, first London game of the year, Falcons uh, versus Jaguars across the pond. Uh Shout out to all of our, our European listeners who may or may not be going to that game. Hope you enjoy it. 
And I do think it is a good game, a uh, sneaky good game, because these are two teams that have not yet played their best football. They've had flashes. They've had spurts of brilliance, followed by, oh, my God, what are you doing? Um, there are plenty of questions abound, but I also think that the issues that we have seen for both of these teams so far are very fixable. And the bones of the houses are good. Uh, not all the way there yet, but the bones are good. Does that make sense, EJ? Makes perfect sense to me. And the other reason that is sort of a piggyback to the idea of they haven't played their best games yet is this is a fun game because we get to see two teams with completely different styles clash. And I honestly don't know who's going to come out on top because of what you led in with. They've played inconsistent football so far, and neither one is quote unquote right or necessarily better right now, but they are very different. The Jags offense, QB driven with Trevor, hasn't totally clicked yet, but it's been close. And that's what you're talking about. We've seen almost we've seen oh man they're really close to being where they were at the end of last year which was impressive offensively this feels like the game that they could hit their stride on and go off the the Atlanta defense has been good but also the Jags are it feels like they're getting right or at least it felt like they were getting right in the second half of last week's game so it's possible that this is the one where they hit on all cylinders and the engine really takes off the Falcons offense is I don't know, QB averse, if I'm being nice. Is that a thing? It's If I'm being positive, it's running back driven, not QB averse. It's, again, neither style is correct, but it's really the differences of how the two teams are built. This is fundamental. This is not like, oh, we suffered an injury, so we had to pivot and we're going to do something else. This is how both of them lined up and said, we're going to win at the beginning of the season. And now we get to see them go against each other. Both teams have very good defenses. Um, Jags, young, fast, aggressive. Atlanta, you know, third best in the league in yards allowed, just outside the top 10 in TDs allowed. So it's not like it's going to be an easy day for Trevor and company, even if they do hit their stride. And a lot of games, I don't know about you, I look at the slate and I go, yeah, they're probably going to win. Yeah, they're probably going to win. Yeah. This one, I'm like, mm, I'm. I'm not sure who's going to win. And London games are always a bit weird, too, with all the travel. Um, but less so that and more so, these are just two completely different animals uh, in terms of how they're put together on the offensive side. And I want to see which one of them gets rolling early. It's kind of interesting because both teams are decent matchups for each other. Um, mm -hmm. You know, on one hand... The, the Jags have a really good run defense. They have one of the better run defenses in the league so far this year. Uh, extremely stingy against the ground, but they give up a lot of catches and a lot of yards to running backs in space, which we know that Bijan is a phenomenal receiver. And the Jags have been one of the leakier defenses in terms of corralling running backs in the past game. So it's a great matchup for Bijan as a receiver. Uh, and then on the flip side, the Falcons have a pretty stingy pass defense, largely because their pass rush is good. They're eighth in overall pass rush win rate uh, across their entire defensive line. Now, in terms of total pressures, they're not that high up there because they haven't had as many like true pass rush opportunities just based on the opponents they played and the scripts, the game scripts that, that have, uh, have transpired. But when they are given an opportunity to rush the passer, they're really, really good at it. Um, and then uh, on, the, on the coverage side of things, like how does their coverage work behind it? This was kind of an interesting an interesting poll when I was kind of doing a deep dive into their defense. So they're ninth best overall in completion percentage allowed, about 65%, which sounds decent, but relative to a lot of defenses in the NFL, like 65% is great by modern standards. However, if you zoom in on the intermediate area of the field, and keep in mind the intermediate area between 10, 20 yards, you would expect there to be a pretty high completion percentage there, right? Because it's... It's not stretching the field. You know, it's a lot of rhythm and timing throws. Uh, it, it, it should be higher than 65%. It is not. They allow 37.5% completions on intermediate throws. That is the strength of this defense is clogging throwing lanes, you know, uh, getting bodies in between quarterback and receiver over the middle. Uh, you know, just really challenging the layups and then forcing you to take shots deep or forcing you into just being a 
painfully boring quick passing game so they can rally and tackle. But they don't they don't allow easy first downs on intermediate throws. Um, and it's just it's really, really impressive how they do it. Uh, again, they're another defense that's very man coverage heavy and very cover three heavy on first down. They play a lot of quarters and quarter, quarter half on second down, so they kind of depart from the Bills in that way. Bills are very uh, man heavy on second down. The Falcons are a little bit more conservative on second down so far. And then they're back to man coverage and blitzing and calling fire zone on third down and just being disruptive and aggressive and, and playing tight coverage. You know, they want to they wanna force that ball out quick. Uh, they trust their DBs to be sticky, and, and they they really believe in their secondary. You know, clearly they believe in their secondary based on their style of play. So it's, again, a, a very stingy defense, a very aggressive defense. Their pass rush is good. If they put the Jags in a position where they have to sit back and throw, it's not going to be easy for Jacksonville. It's really not. Like, they're, they're a much better defense than they get given credit for. Um, in terms of how I think the Jags should attack this defense, you know, when I was looking at tendencies uh, on film last night, I was up till, <laughs> till like 1 a.m. and I was like, how would I deal with this? Like if I was Doug Peterson, how would I deal with this? <laughs> and I was like, what, what if we borrowed some stuff from Miami? Let's see how they handle motion. So I watched every snap from the first three weeks of how do the Falcons handle motion? Because they're a very man coverage heavy defense right they don't spin into motion meaning like if they're in a two high shell they don't they don't have their their safeties rotate down into a one high look on motion um you know they don't they don't bump the coverage over like they have their nickel corner um d alford if i recall correctly is his name they have their nickel corner number 20 run with that motion every time it's like that is your guy. You stay on your guy. We are not giving you help. You got to you got to haul ass, dude. And so he's kind of taking this long way around the linebackers every single time. There's a jet motion. Doesn't matter if it's a run play. Doesn't matter if it's a pass play. Like he is on his horse and he's going. So what I would do if I'm the Jags is I run the ball, but I run it with jet motion, and then I do it again and I do it again and I do it again <laughs> and I make D. Alford exhausted. By the end yeah, of the first try and, quarter. Try and crack 20,000 steps for the day. Absolutely. Like, I want yeah. his Fitbit to melt. And then in the <laughs> second quarter, when he's nice and tired, we put Calvin Ridley in the slot and say, go ahead, run with him now. That's how we yeah. hit the shot. Is we tire, is we tire that nickel out, and then we just blow right by him. That That's what I would do, at least. And if you pair it with play action so that, He's not sure if that run's coming, and you take a deep play action shot off the slot late. I'm down. I think it's really interesting that it's a man heavy defense, which really relies on their players being better than your players. I mean, that's the, you're not going to make that up as much in man as you are in zone. And I want to go back to the summer we, in the previous series when we talked about the Falcons. We talked about their linebacking core. We said, man, Caden Ellis. First off, we said the linebacking come, core comes from Idaho and Colorado. <laughs> like, it's Nate Landman and Caden Ellis. And Caden Ellis, we said, was a sneaky ad. Grab it from your division rival, right? Played better than a lot of people thought. Didn't have a lot of name recognition. Nate Landman is the other guy. He's the, the number two linebacker that plays between in their, you know, they play a four linebacker look, but their outside linebackers are really edges. Um, in terms of their off-ball linebackers, it's Landman and Ellis. And... For a defense that is a good and b man heavy, I think that's probably an unexpected outcome for a lot of people when they look at them. Like, if you asked a lot of people around the league who aren't Falcons fans, like, "Hey, name a name a starting linebacker for the Falcons," you know, inside. Wait a minute, be like, I just put that together. Is that Luther's kid? Uh, All right, Wikipedia. He is. That is Luther Ellis's kid. How yep, about that? He looks. He looks like him. So, anyways. He's playing a lot of, he played a lot of great ball last year. And again, we said that in the preview episode, we said, Hey, you know, this is, this is not the, the headline move in free agency, but you're stealing from a division rival. He played better than like, it's the ideal free agency target guy. That's not going to cost a ton of money is outperforming. Um, what we'd call his name recognition status. Um, it's just a really good get and Falcons are paying that off early in the season. 
Sorry, my ADD brain interrupted you there, but I, I heard Ellis in Idaho, and I was like, yep. that has to be. <laughs> there's I, there's I no other way. <laughs> I love it when your ADD brain makes connections like that. Um, you know, and I'm sure our buddy Alex Katzen sitting at home right now going, of course, you didn't know that. And we're like, no, Alex, we didn't. Our brain doesn't work like yours, but that's cool. Also, fun fact, Luther Ellis apparently had 12 kids, so there's just there's a lot of those running around. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, they listed all of uh, uh, Puka Nakua's brothers on the Monday night game that have played before him. <laughs> and I was like, how, oh, how yeah. big is his family? Uh, I don't know how big the family is overall, but he's had three brothers play before him. Really? Wow. Yes. All right. In terms of underdog slip, I alluded to this before. Uh, Bijan, higher than 22.5 yards receiving. Uh, The Jags defense so far has allowed more than that in every single game, and they have yet to play against a running back like Bichon. So it stands to reason that's a pretty good bet. Yeah, he could get that on one angle route out of the backfield. I mean, honestly, he could pay that bet off in one play. So I I like my chances there. Like, give him, you know, four receptions in the entire game. I bet he beats that. All right, fourth game. On the docket, Bears Broncos. Finally here, EJ. Uh, I'm just yeah. gonna let you go. You 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 can start yeah. and just get all your frustrations out, get all your pain out. <laughs> I'll sit here sipping my rum, and uh, you you let me know when you're ready. We don't have time for that. All my frustrations and pain. <laughs> That'd be a three hour podcast. That'd be no fun. Or maybe if you're really into that sort of thing, it would be fun, which is weird. But if you're into violently incompetent things, this is your game. Because as much as the game we talked about at the top with the Bills and the Dolphins, we talked about how good both of those teams are on both sides of the ball. There's not a lot to look for in this game from either team. Each team is being objectively pretty horrible, really, really bad, like. Denver just gave up 70 to Miami, and yes, Miami is a great offense, but again, you have to work at it if you're going to give up 70. 70 is historically high in terms of point totals to give up. Um, Neither team is remotely good, but if you're into carnage watching because that's what this is going to be, there's a few things to focus on kind of out of the corner of your eye while you're really doing something else more productive with your life. (laughs) Russ has shown signs of life. He was downright sharp at points through the first half last week. Which really surprised me. Again, in rewatch of that game, I went back expecting the Broncos to just roll over early and play dead the entire time. And up to the two-minute warning, that was a game, and a lot of it was Russ hitting receivers in stride. The receiving core looked pretty good. Again, they've been like an engine that misfires, where one piston goes off and the others don't go in concert. They have good receivers, but they don't all work together in the same half the same way. And they did in the first half against the Dolphins and kept that team close, which was kind of amazing. So see if Russ is able to continue that. It's tough to say continue because he fell off pretty hard in the second half, but it was a very good game out of him, and we didn't really see any of those last year. And we've seen not a lot of those this year. So there's a little spark for Broncos watchers there. Broncos wide receivers could definitely get get healthy against a very depleted Bears secondary. Like, the Bears secondary has been struggling just like every other part of the team, but they are down three starters most likely in this game. We'll see. We're recording this Wednesday morning, so we don't have the full injury report, but it is very possible uh, that they are going to be into some names that you don't recognize because they're guys that got called up off the practice squad. So that, too, could be good for the Broncos. Very little good on the Bears' side to watch for. Um, Justin maybe hitting a few open throws would be nice if there are any. There really weren't last week. In the previous two weeks, he was absolutely missing throws that gets he had schemed open for him on the on the good plays because, again, there's enough blame to – to spread around here it's not just justin or just luke getsy it was both last week he didn't look good but again we talked about how good the chiefs defense was they were terrific against the bears there weren't a lot of open receivers to hit so kind of hard to fault him for that uh there should be some more openings against the broncos secondary again not many if he hits a few open throws maybe shows a little anticipation that would be a nugget other than that 
um, semi-competent pass blocking from the hodgepodge old line that the Bears chucking out there, like not allowing like multiple free rushers per half would be progress. And then maybe a nice run or two from Khalil Herbert or Roshan. Like that's that's pretty much it. If you're sort of circling, you're like, hey, I'd like to see in this game from either team. That's the docket. That's the slate. It's it's not pretty. Um, that's about it. Should be a really awful game. I'm guessing Denver comes out <laughs> on top. Um, you know, they gave up 70 in the previous week, and the opening line last Sunday for this game was them favored by two and a half. Think about that. You gave up a historic worst for NFL points in the top 10 for historic worst of NFL points allowed, and you're favored on the road in your next game. That means your opponent sucks i i understand kind of going back here to the beginning i understand the notion that polls might survive this year mm. but that uh but that Eberflus won't however if people recall <laughs> uh polls was the one who hired Eberflus. and sort of uh, he he was he was given the final three options uh, from yeah, Polian, but... which was Jim Caldwell, Eberflus, yeah. and Dan Quinn. They interviewed yeah. Doug Peterson and didn't hire him. They interviewed Brian Dable. He wasn't he he wasn't a finalist. They didn't even I... interview Mike McDaniel. So like I I refuse to put all of that on Bill Polian. Like Ryan Poles was powerless to choose his own head coach. Bullshit. Bullshit. Like you don't even I'd interview actually, Mike McDaniel. <laughs> I don't think that's bullshit. Actually, I I think there's more truth to that as a young, exceptionally young GM in his 30s, in his first GM role, coming into, um, let's just say, an organization that runs like the Bears. It is quite possible they handed him a slate and said, pick between these three, without giving him the chance to cast the net wider. I'm not saying he would have. I'm saying he might have, and it is highly likely, having been a Bears watcher and follower for a long time, that they would do something like that. And people outside would say, especially with hindsight, um, why would they do that? That's a terrible idea. Well, all the, the all the guys you right and that has to be considered for people who are like oh well the smart thing to do is you're like oh let me stop you there <laughs> then the bears are out like they don't do the smart thing for the most part so it is very possible that he had limited choices and thought that Eberflus was the best of his limited choices that can be on him but the whole idea that he could interview anybody and hire anybody he wanted to is a hundred percent false so was it uh, was he hamstrung by ownership to trade for Claypool? You know, was he the one that was was he forced to draft Cla Valus Jones? Was I was think he Claypool forced? hangs on him? No, I think Valus and Claypool <laughs> hang on him. The there's coaching just, part. So many shitty moves that I'm like, no, I'm with you there. I'm not gonna say that Ryan Poles has a sterling record so far. Ryan Poles uh, has two parts to his young tenure as GM. One is he had to clean house last year financially. There was there was no other way. The previous regime had made a lot of bad choices. Bad contracts, bad draft picks, whatever else. And if this team was going to be competitive, he had to do the Reggie McKenzie for the Raiders thing and scrape the books clean. And he did a phenomenal job of that. Like that takes fortitude. Now that was all to get a historically large purse to go spend in free agency, a war chest, if you will. How he has spent that and how he has traded and how he has used draft picks is the other side of that equation. So the sort of logistical cleanup management side, I give him very high marks because that was not an easy thing to do. And it's also not fair to say, hey, you get to do all the gar you get to take all the garbage out, but that's all the rope we're going to give you and we're going to fire you. Like, that's not great. But what he has done with the resources he's had, both in free agency and the draft, I am with you. There are questionable moves there that I don't think are going to pay off. Some might, but there is more down than up in both of those categories so far. 
And that hangs on him. The coaching thing, no. You know, giving him demerits for doing what he had to do and scraping out the garbage and cleaning off the books, also no. What he's done with all this money and all those draft picks, I think there is more questions. There are more questions there than answers, and I am with you that I am not like just willing at this point to sort of give benefit of the doubt and say, oh, it's cool. Like, mm, that part hangs on your resume. That's all yours. Yeah. The other stuff, there's some balance there. Is it equal? Mm. If if Poles truly doesn't have the power, and again, if he has the power to make bad picks, he's the power to make bad picks. But if he doesn't have the power to hire coaches, I wouldn't even want to be there. Because at I, the end of the day, like that's that's going to determine whether or not I, I get employed anyway, right? I don't know. This yes, is it is. And there was a, a I don't want to say famous, there was an incident uh, on the sidelines at Family Fest. Family Fest is the one practice that the Bears hold at Soldier Field per year. Uh, they come away from House Hall and they have basically a scrimmage open practice at, at Soldier Field. They sell tickets. It's called Family Fest. Uh, prior to that practice going off, prior to that event, um, Poles was talking to Getsy on the sidelines in what has been described as animated tones. He was, by all accounts, in his body language, not a happy dude. Like, and again, Getsy, if you're going to hire a coach, you're, you're not going to meddle as a GM. You're going to hire a coach and then you're going to say, go hire your staff because, you know, that their results are on you, so I'm not going to say who you have to hire. It was pretty clear that Poles was pretty upset with something that had gone on. Now, that can be a little thing that happened during the day. It could be, you know, tensions boiling over from a longer held, like, hey, why aren't you, you know, using <laughs> the groceries I bought? Like, we don't know what happened in that conversation. Zero intel on that, period. But Looking back now that the season has pretty much gone in the toilet after three weeks, there are things like that where you go, oh, it didn't always look super rosy. And look, every coaching staff and, and you know players and coaches get into it on the sideline. It doesn't mean that the team is tanking or done or unable to compete. That's just competitive fire boiling over a lot of times. It's going to come under a brighter spotlight when you have – I'll just say have the results you have or the lack of results you have. Um, things like that are going to get more attention and everybody's going to try and read the tea leaves for the rest of the season because the coaching staff is as good as gone. Like you don't get to be this bad. And it, we're talking about pretty historic levels of incompetence at this point across the board. It's not just the defense, not just the offense. It's not that players aren't progressing. This was a great one that came up to me is when's the last player – that the Bears picked that you really feel like got a lot better, like really progressed? Uh, hopefully Dexter. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's Braxton Jones, but, I guess, you know. But, I mean, think about it. When's the last player that came in? Because everybody's like, oh, well, this person. And it's like, no, there are organizations that are bad at developing talent, but they are usually bad at developing talent in one position group or on one side of the ball at worst. And there are places where they are good at it. Who's the last Bears player that came in that got, like, way better? From where they came in the league to where they are now, I can't think of any that had, like, a super high growth curve. It was either they came in and they were already at an acceptable level of good, like, say, Darnell Mooney. Um, or Eddie Jackson. Yeah, or, Mooney's the one that's sort of borderline for me, but literally that's the one guy. Like, that's the one guy that, like, was borderline, and I was like, wow, he he's definitely better. He does more things now than he did when he came in. And, look, lots of guys do that. Diet, conditioning, coaching, you hope. You can't, you can't necessarily hang it on one thing or another, but to have none – to not be able to go, oh, well, this guy and this guy and this guy all improved pretty markedly. Like, yeah. If if you're thinking of one that's a maybe, like it's an organizational thing at that point. I uh, I just think back to, so when we were at Shrine Bowl, we didn't go to Senior Bowl. We were just at Shrine Bowl. Um, 
and then we had we had friends at the Senior Bowl, and Getsy was at the Senior Bowl, um, and we had heard that week from multiple people that were like, "This Getsy thing isn't going to work. This is going to be a fucking disaster." And we weren't there, right? So it's like we we couldn't determine that for ourselves. So we we yeah. still had you know these kind of rose colored or orange colored glasses on during the summer of like, well, you know, again, we we weren't there to watch him interact with players. We weren't there to watch him coach. Like maybe this will work. I'm starting to think all of them were right. Like all the people <laughs> that were texting us of like this Getty thing is is not going to work. We we probably should have listened to them. It's tough at that point, you know, because we heard things to the contrary too. That hey, it looked good during camp. This is going to work. So it's it's all about finding you know what are the real positives, what are the false positives, what are the false negatives, and and you sort it out. And again, in hindsight, sure. Like hindsight, it's easier to figure lots of things out, like the draft and coaching hires and everything else. But you don't have that at the time. And there was a lot of optimism all the way through camp. Like now everybody's going back through it with a fine tooth comb and saying, oh, we should have known. And I'm like, should should we have or yeah, should that, this be that July out? optimism? It's different, man. Everything. Everything's and perfect in the summer. <laughs> The, the one thing that gets me is how conditioned Bears fans are to accept really sort of abject failure and make excuses. Like, there are other fan bases that where, you know, the quarterback is not great <laughs> and they don't like him. But, you know, they oftentimes don't say there's not a large section or cross section of fans who say, oh, well, if this was all perfect, he'd be great. Like it's everybody else's fault, right? And that can be any player. It's not just the quarterback. This isn't heaping on Justin. But Bears fans are so used to like, well, they would have ruined that guy anyways. (laughs) If you're talking about some other quarterback, they're like, well, they would have trashed him too. And I'm like, if that's what you're saying about your team, like your team is failing you like as a fan and there isn't any if ands or buts about it the bears have the fourth most losses in the last 10 years like of any team in the nfl like i'm surprised there's three more (laughs) it's a results driven (laughs) business and yeah that again that's you know that's i think a typical bears fan response right now what do you mean we're not we're not best at being worst um they're not but like it's a 32 team league and 10 years is a pretty good sample size and you are the fourth worst performer in your chosen realm of endeavor for the last decade. Like that's a fact. Like you can say why and what and forever. And believe me, bears fans do. They find lots of reasons. I get it. This is a bad franchise and it's been bad for a long time. And the arrow is not pointing up right now. There are, there are teams that are pulling themselves up by the bootstraps. The bears are not one. It will take uh, a massive culture shift, which which usually only comes from a, a shift in ownership. Which obviously that's that's not going to happen for uh, ever at this pace. Um, and so, when whenever that day comes, whenever it happens to be, that's when I finally expect the organization to change. Because um, it it all starts at the top, man. It really does. And it's depressing, but it is what it is. So Bears fans, uh, again, pop that Malort. <laughs> See you in 2024. It's a good run while it lasted. When, when yeah, a whole there are weeks. already people that? saying it doesn't matter if they get Caleb because they're going to ruin him too. And I'm like, come on, people. <laughs> like, if that's, if that's your outlook on your team is that they're going to take a, you know, a guy that is genuinely considered to be a, and I hate the term generational prospect. He is a really, really, really good quarterback prospect. And you're saying, well, doesn't matter if they get him. They're going to, they're going to mess him up too. It's like, it's, it's a moot point. Okay. He's going back to USC. If the bears are picking number one anyway, let's be honest. Well, I don't, I don't know if that's true. Everybody says, Oh, the NIL money, but I'm like, he's, he's not getting 50 million of NIL money. And if he signs as the number one overall pick, he gets 50 million. Believe me, it's like, not his decision. I understand that. And you know we'll what I'm see. talking about. It's I do, decision. and we and we will see. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> All right, let's get to a, a much more exciting game. A game yes. that you and I will be at in person. We'll be uh, in Dallas, Texas this Sunday, watching uh, 
Dak versus Belichick part four, I think it is. I think this is the <laughs> third or fourth time that they played against each other. There's been yeah. mixed results throughout Dak's career. Bill's gotten him. He's gotten Bill. It's been a nice little back and forth. Uh, I will say, though, the Dak that we have seen so far in 2023, as well as the Dak that we saw in 2022, is not the best version of Dak. He he really likes giving the ball away. So uh, I know it's easy to pick the Cowboys to win this game, just like it felt easy to pick the Cowboys to beat the Cardinals. But when your red zone offense stinks and your quarterback's giving the ball away, uh, this is a very beatable Cowboys team. So uh, I expect this to be a lot closer than people think. If these games had been switched in the schedule, I think it would be easy to pick the Cowboys against the Patriots, but they didn't. They played the Cardinals last week. They did not have a great week. We've talked at length about that. We reviewed that game. It puts the sort of overall result of this one in a much cloudier sort of position. The crystal ball is not clear on this one. Dallas needs to get back to playing their brand of football after the Cardinals forced their hand in an off week and showed how beatable they can be when they don't play well. And if Dallas plays well, make no mistake, they win this game. But they have to play well. And that's not guaranteed after last week. The defense defense has to really come out and smother O'Brien's offense into very lengthy, low percentage drives. And there have been defenses that have been able to do that this year to make sure that there are 11 and 12 play drives on tap because Mac can execute them. But asking him to execute them time after time after time becomes a lower percentage affair and also just slows them down. They're not going to score a ton of points. So if your offense can break through against Belichick's defense, not a certainty. But if you can do that two or three times and force Bill O'Brien and Mack into these long 11, 12 play grinding drives with no explosives, the Patriots are very beatable. Um, They have to get the run going because... This is New England. They have to get the run going against Dallas. We know Dallas wants to smother it. But if you can't get that run going and you put it all on Mac and it's just back throwing, Mac throwing, Mac throwing, then Micah gets to pin his ears back and come after him. And I don't think you can hold up all day. You can chip him, but he is wildly talented. He's the best edge rusher in the league right now. And he does at least a couple things every week. He even did them last week that are just like, nobody else can do that so if you're increasing the number of dropbacks for mac yeah might not be a healthy day for him steelers and browns fans gonna come for you i know they <laughs> are the i best. know they are yeah and and i think that's a great discussion to have like we talked about how good miles is i i think i picked tj watt for my defensive player of the year this year in the overall like those are all guys that can be in the conversation it's like picking the top receiver And you're going to have some people, you know, prior to last year that are going to say, oh, Justin Jefferson's a guy. Before that was Devontae Adams was the consensus number one. Like all those guys are good and worthy receivers. Like, but right now, if you want, I I think the most dynamic overall and what Micah adds is his ability to play all over the field and do things that TJ, I don't really want TJ and Miles doing in terms of coverage and the way that Dallas moves Mike around. That's an extra dimension. He's as good a rusher as they are, and he can do that stuff. So for me, that makes him the top. Uh, In terms of how the Patriots defense matches up with Dak, and uh, by the way, on the underdog slip, the only hire that I took in this game was Dak higher than 0.5 interceptions. So I'm I'm banking on him (laughs) doing his Dak thing and throwing a pick here. Uh, Also forgot to mention I took Calvin Ridley – over 68 and a half receiving. I forgot to, to bring that up in the Atlanta game, but um, I took Dak higher on picks because with all the man coverage that New England plays, they're a pretty heavy cover three team on first down. Like that, they they run more cover three than most other teams on first down. But then they ramp up the man coverage as it goes on. You know, it's like 30 percent man coverage on second down, nearly 50 percent. On third down, like they're the highest out of anybody on third down. Uh, but in particular, the type of man coverage that they run, you know, they'll they'll typically start out too high and then roll a guy down to play robber in the intermediate middle of the field. They'll play one rat, you know, having the whole defender low. Um, sometimes they'll call one dog, you know, behind a, a five man rush and, and trust their guys to get home. And what one dog does is it it tends to pop guys free 
if uh, if you ca- if you kind of catch them in a way where they're sliding away from it, we're outnumbering them. We got an extra guy, forces Dak into a bad throw, which he's done before against New England. You know, under pressure, throwing it to Stephon Gilmore back in the day against man coverage. Um, but also all that man coverage on third down when you have uh, help in the middle of the field, zone help in the middle of the field, is they play so tight. And when they have contested catch opportunities, you know, they get a hand in there, they pop the ball up. They love playing robber because that robber safety is right there to catch a tip drill or the rat defender and one rat's right there to catch a tip drill. Like they they love having zone help in the intermediate and short area of the field when they call man coverage specifically for tip drills. You know, it's not just we have a post safety 25 yards deep. It's like, no, we have guys around the ball when we play man because man coverage tends to produce a lot of balls popped in the air. So uh, I'm I'm betting on a pick here. Whether or not New England capitalizes on it, we'll see. Again, the offense, uh, Max doing what he can, <laughs> you know, behind a, a beleaguered offensive line with limited weapons to throw to in a run game that doesn't work. I don't know if they'll be able to capitalize on it, but I do think that it will be a uh, a, a low scoring, dare I say, ugly game between two good defenses. And if either team cracked 20, I'd be surprised. I think that's generally the take is that, you know, if New England plays the game they want, Cowboys are not going to score a lot of points. And if Dallas gets back into form or rounds back into their defensive form, they're going to be frustrating the Patriots and and we're not going to see a ton of points there either. We're going to see more field goals than we are touchdowns. We're going to see longer drives, which means less scoring overall. I think both teams kind of want that, um, at least on the defensive side. Of course, both the offenses want to run the score up. Um, not really sure the Patriots are capable of that. It's possible, but it'll take some big breakdowns um, <laughs> in Dallas. Like, yeah, it would take multiple breakdowns, busted coverages, things that they typically don't do. They're they're better coached than that on the defensive side of the ball. So I'm with you. Low scoring. I don't want to call it ugly. I'll call it tactical. Um, and in terms of your... <laughs> In okay. terms of your, in terms of your DAC pick, pick uh, for the slip, uh, you know they're going to throw some up with um, CD Lamb and and Gonzo one on one, and I I don't mind his chances there either. He's somebody that could pay that off. You know, is he going to get one? I don't know. I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on that. Is that the way that New England could get one too, along with their super physical crossing zone, uh, you know, tip drill heavy way they typically get them in the middle of the field yeah it's just as likely that you bomb one up and gonzo jumps out of the gym and grabs it again like he can do it all right let's get to parting glass uh a little bit of a a short segment at the end of the episode where we just have other notes that didn't fit in the rest of the show that we just want to unload while we still can ej i'll let you go first uh, one, I've just got a few defensive eye openers from early stats of the season here. Zaire Franklin is having his I've arrived season. That Indianapolis defense seems to be able to highlight linebacking talent in a way that a lot of other defenses don't. Um, he leads the league in tackles and he's just flying around for the Colts defense. I know that the way tackles are recorded are a very subjective stat. Doesn't matter. It's passing the eye test. Like Zaire Franklin is flying around on the Colts defense, making plays for them. Um, Daniel Hunter, second in the league in sacks after talks this offseason that he would be shipped out. He is still producing one of the most athletic and capable edge rushers um, on a defense that we don't talk a ton about. We talked early about Flores' pressure. We talked about Ivan Pace a little bit, but feels like Daniel Hunter, again, is a primary rush threat in the NFL, sack threat. Um, doesn't a lot of people talked about him in the offseason not a ton of people talking about him during the season and the last one is a note for a guy that we saw at the shrine bowl records alum christian isian who is playing out of the world right out of his world right now just out of the gate for tampa bay he's tied for second in interceptions in the league and he looks like the real deal early again interceptions can be fickle um he's going to continue to earn them much the way you said the patriots earn them by being physical by being around the ball um very very athletic guy. One of the most impressive things about him was just how well built physically he was when you got next to him on the practice field. Um, always brought his pads behind his hits um, really fast. It was just a question of how well he would adapt to scheme and how quickly. 
he's ahead of, I would say, even my my best projections for him, he's playing better than that. I mean, a UDFA, a rookie UDFA DB being this good is is not a normal thing. So uh, hell of a pickup for, for Tampa there. Uh, my parting glass note, of course, didn't get to talk about the Texans in this episode, so I gotta I gotta fit him in somewhere. Houston has two receivers right now in the top twelve in the league in yardage. It is number eleven and number twelve. Nico Collins and Tank Dell, both top twelve in yardage. Uh, Stroud's obviously playing out of his mind. Uh, he's there's no denying that he's he's been one of the best. Considering the circumstances, he's been one of the better quarterbacks in the league so far, which sounds insane for a rookie on a quote unquote bad team. But he's kind of the only thing that's that's been that's been giving me hope lately, and he's he's looked phenomenal. Um, but his receivers have been a big part of his success. Nico's been fantastic. Tank Dell has been like I I liked Tank Dell on tape. I really did. I recognized that his separation ability was otherworldly. He was a great red zone weapon. He had like what like 18 touchdowns for for Houston last year. Like he's he's a very good player. My concerns with him were not about ability and skill. My concerns with him were about can he hold up at 165 or whatever he was. Uh and so far he is shattering my expectations. 80% of his snaps have been outside. He is not a slot weapon. He is an outside receiver at 165 pounds, and he's been a damn good one at that. So, uh, Tank Dell, you are officially part of the uh, honorary Devontae Smith uh, doesn't matter how much you weigh club. Welcome to the NFL. You're a great receiver. Agree heartily on both counts. Stroud's been great. Nico started off really hot. I think he will come back. We really liked his profile, and I feel like he's getting to pay a bunch of that off. And Tank Dell, man, you just you can't touch him. He's really good. He was a guy that I sort of was like, oh, I'm not sure about. And then when I went and did my full study on him, I came out. I remember vividly telling you, nah, Tank Dell's not what people think he is. He's way better than that. And you were like, I don't know. I was like, no, no, he's way better than that. Like all over the field, especially in the red zone. I mean, his distance between the next most effective red zone receiver in college last year was ridiculous. This was basically like double his touchdowns in the red zone. So to anybody else in the in the country. So really, really good. Really cool to see him vibing with that offense with Bobby Slowick, with Stroud so early, having that connection, being so effective. And again, like you said, playing outside, which is not where people projected him, and having tons of success. I'm just love it. Here for it. Uh, all right. Before we get out of here, I want to thank Homage for partnering with us to help sponsor the show. Uh, I'll probably throw some some footage in here of me wearing that Texan starter jacket that I got last week, finally. It is awesome. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar, Homage has an NFL license, so they do a whole bunch of different, uh, not just merch and clothing, but also those starter jackets. They did a collab with Star to, Starter to do team-specific starter jackets, which I think are still available. Um, but some. If you're a fan, some, some, not all, some. I think the Crimsicles are still there if you're a Tampa fan. Um, but if you're a fan of any football team at all and you want to get some really cool you know, merch to rep your team, Anything that you buy from Homage, we get a cut of. So it's a great way to support your team and support the show at the same time. All of it's really awesome. The clothes are, are, again, I don't understand how they're that soft. I've washed my hoodie like five times at this point, and it's still super soft. So some sort of magic cotton in there, but uh, (laughs) zero complaints so far with everything I've got from Homage. Uh, Again, everything you buy from them at the link in the description below directly supports bootleg. Uh, we also want to thank our executive producers over in the executive producer uh, executive producer tier on Patreon. Marat, Consti, Andrew, Liam, Connor, and Mike L. Once again, thank all of you for supporting us. Um, EJ, any final words? I uh, want to thank all the folks that have signed up for Patreon, whether they're not they're executive producers. There's a bunch of you that have signed up this month. want to let you know that all your support at any level is really meaningful to us. It helps us do all kinds of cool things that bring you cool content. So thank you very, very much for doing that. Uh, With that, I got to start packing for Dallas. Well, technically I got to start packing for Portland, then Atlanta, then Dallas, because it's a, it's a whirlwind weekend for me. (laughs) I got to go from LA to 
Dallas by way of two different cities in like 36 hours. So that should be fun. Uh, but I will I will see you there at AT and T Stadium, and then we are both going to be flying out basically right after the game to come back and do our our week four recap show. So uh, we will see you guys on Monday and or Tuesday morning for that. And uh, yeah, see you soon. We'll be right back.